So I'll give everyone maybe like about another minute. Thank you all so much uh, for the quick turnaround and getting back to us for wanting to come to this event and for supporting Cindy Veach and uh, Harry. Uh, we're so, so excited to have them together. Uh, what's really great about these virtual experiences is that you can have a bunch of different authors from all around the states um, and you can just book them together in these really awesome uh, kind of pairings. Uh, so th there, there are many things to think of in terms of like the glass being half full and, and in this situation I feel like we're really brought together in, in ways that we haven't been able to been brought together before. So this is all very exciting. Hi Danny, nice to see you, January. Everyone else, thank you. So uh, let me give you just a bit of how tonight is going to go. Uh, this is going to be uh, pre-recorded and put on our YouTube channel. So anyone that is trying to get on that can't get on or couldn't make it, they'll be able to watch it later. Um, I am Dimitri Reyes. I am the Marketing and Communications Director at Cabin Carry Press. So I have the blessing to be able to form these kind of events together and have all the communications with the authors. Um, anything that you see on the website or social media, uh, I'm usually behind that with my trusty assistant, uh, Gabe Cleveland, which is the managing editor. He basically does everything, everything that has to do with this press. Um, and then Joan Cusack Handler, which is the founder, um, and publisher, Joan, thank you so much for everything that you've done with the press. And Jonathan, thank you so much for making sure that we have money in our pockets. Jonathan is the coordinator for getting us grants and um, he's our board liaison. So the four of us really try to carry this press and try to do our best to advocate our authors uh, like Harry and Cindy. So this is how it's going to work this evening. We're going to have a 20 minute reading, 10 minutes each. Um, and while that's happening, everyone knows that chat box that's at the bottom of their pages. Please, if you see any, if you hear any wonderful words or poignant points, I would love for you to put that in the chat box to start a conversation. Um, Jonathan and Gabriel are very active in the chat box, so they'll be able to have that pitch and catch conversation with you. Um, also, think about any questions. After the 20 minute reading, we're going to take a brief 15 minute Q&A portion where they'll be answering work from their Cavan Carey Press books that have been published with us before. I say that and I make that point because afterwards they do have some new work that they've been working on. Uh, writers are readily writing all the time, so I thought it was also poignant for them to introduce us to some of their new work. So after that Q&A session, we'll have another session where they'll, where they'll read from some of their new work briefly and then we'll close out with a larger discussion and then we'll all get to go to bed depending on where we are uh, in the states right now. Uh, so without further ado I'm going to read off the bios for Harry and Cindy and then we'll start our reading. Thank you. So Harry's first. Harry Levin was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is the author of two previous poetry collections, The Christmas Show, the winner of the Bernard New Woman's Poets Prize, the Poetry Society of America's uh, Alice Faye de Castanola Award, and the Philadelphia Inquirer Best Book of the Year, and Girl in Cap and Gown, a national poetry series finalist. She is also the author of the novel, How Fast Can You Run? A novel based on the life of Michael Mujok Cook. Uh, profiled on NPR. She holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Iowa and teaches writing and directs the certificate programs in writing and publishing at Drexel University. So now for Cindy. Cindy Veach received an MFA from the University of Oregon. Her poetry has appeared in the Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, Agni, Prairie Schooner, Poet Lore, The Journal, The North American Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, Nimrod International Journal, and elsewhere. She is an award-winning uh, quilter whose work was selected to tour with the Smithsonian. She lives in Manchester Bay by the uh, Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts. So, without further ado, we will be moving on to our reading. Harry, take it away. Okay. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to be reading from my new. Well, 2016, <laughs> Calvin Curry book, My Oceanography. I was going to launch this book at AWP this year. So this is a great, great launch. Up the Down Road. I know you know that I'm the better artist, but you had me convinced that you were better. 
you had the bigger studio, the fellowship, the windows facing the rainbow. The sky turned ultraviolet after the tornado. Weather, too, bestowed upon you prizes, gave you the retina of an oriole while I got shook. Fish nibbled at my feet, big pucker fish, in water too murky to see their stripes, and it rained. I remembered to grab a tree trunk and hug it, get down on the deck with bits of leaves peppered flat to it, the wind dancing itself into a frenzy, tapping me like the drunk at a party, his mis mismatched socks showing. Yet holding a fellowship marked you as someone to watch. In that way, we were the same. Only I was shoplifting sable hairbrushes at Utrecht because they were too expensive, even with my state tuition reduction. You were on a stipend, you said, that could afford you luxuries, hand mannequins, oil primed linen, sea salt infused chocolates, is exotic fruit plates heaped with mangoes. At open studios, Dominique and Levy, friends of the department head, walked in and bid for your paintings, whispered at their altar, while I scrambled eggs with piri piri powder, scattered shells in our compost, preparing you a welcome like the first meal the pilgrims ate at Plymouth after disembarking and setting their feet down on land. I still love to cook. You could not sour my tongue, my meat, or my bones, despite my hand racing to record all the phases of our breakup in charcoal this cold spring among willows, before stuffing my clothes inside a suitcase, snapping its jaw shut, and wheeling it into the night. These, these poems were inspired by the life of the sculptor Eva Hess. I'm going to read you. Some of them have the titles from the paintings. This one is called Ring Around a Rosy. And my first poem in my oceanography is Ring Around a Rosy. You targeted me and forced my extinction, drew circles around the parts of my body where you dared to aim my neck, my wrists, my breasts. How could I escape your asteroid come hurtling? Too much of my history is etched in stone, like lichen or mica. You subsumed even my shadow and sealed over the crevices where I roamed. You drove long stretches of highway and read my desires in strip mining, my sins exposed, determining where to dig into the sediments repository of old arguments. Jaw hardened, fists banging down, you did not say wait or anything else that broke into words of love because you wanted to render a bee's hover and extract my DNA. Your artist's eye trained on the darkest nights, nothing but a chisel to pick away, standing on top of that airless promontory, bending over the rift to find a trace measure my primitive atmosphere, preserve my dusky voice under glass. <laughs> this is another one based on this painting. It's called Hang Up. This is one of the first paintings that moved the picture frame off the wall to the floor. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. okay. So it's, the painting is called Hang Up and my poem is called Hang Up. A thin bent rod comes out of the frame. There is no painting in the frame, just space penned in, scarce and hardly there, which is our awareness of it. White knuckled, narrow, concealed. There must be something else there, some current visible in a more electric realm of filling lungs with big gulps of air to withstand the rising shock. An inside out world of drenched skin, the full length of the white water, the viewpoint, both emptiness and dependence upon the support, the crumbling schist at the confluence of rich salt springs where the artist abandoned knows deeply the demands of her work, stretches her frames to over life size, winds cloth over wood and steel, to wrap them in the configurement of mind where the materials of Crete, not a bench, just a couple of slats of wood nailed into a rusted girder 
not a drawing, just lines without shape, be ribboning a page, not a self, just gradations of light derived from the combinations, the quiver in your voice over the line as I lean in, hearing it, not hearing it, into my ear, beating of the drum, oscillation of the hairs ridged from having held it. Jacket, shivering from the cold air in the unheated studio, I consider his mistress's denim jacket slung across the arms of his mechanical chair. Wear it, I permit myself, commandeering air like any tumultuous landing past excessive temperatures of heat and ice. Just as I am standing there, warming myself in the jacket, that my breasts and shoulders barely fill, the material gaping cave-like as if someone had suggested it to clarify this contrast, he bursts in. Water running off his umbrella and pouring down on the floor, he rushes over to kiss me, opens his mouth and smiles up at me, and of course, at the jacket, which covers me and my body, metal snaps fastened shut. I think I have time for one more. Um, ah, here it is. These poems, of course, are me and not me, right? They come from Eva's Hess life, where they dovetail with mine. Your words. Parcel to this fall's assemblage. Your words, bitter and cruel, dismiss bark and reject limbs. Your words amass in slow release through my brain and I hear them crunching under heels, cold and severed. Savage words, no longer stone but rubble, no longer wood but ash, no longer earth but sludge, sheltering pain glass as rain rushes and rumbles. Your words and phrases pile up on a bar deck during Oktoberfest, everyone having put down their drinks, nighttime, the faraway moon, while on the creek below, a kayaker dips his paddle in the water, your stirred up words. Your words are screeching, honking, rattling, flapping, whirling. I look up at the sky for ducks, for iridescence bearing itself, long necks twisting and craning. But the thing that's making this tremendous clamor, this approaching onslaught, onslaught so close that I get down on my knees and bow my head is only a landscaper's flatbed. Two men in the cab poking their elbows out the windows. It's clattering engine shovels and shears that lurch forward, then slide back to back. A migration this raucous, far off in the crystalline cloud cover rife with cacophony. Words inscribed with these, simple instruments, grass stain, dull with use. A single cut releases the dying, limp and oozing, half buried and bruised as the truck, an old rusted pickup veers away, breaking down and emitting blame, leaking oil and black exhaust in feathery fumes. Yeah. That's 10 exhaust minutes, right? <laughs> fumes. Yes, thank you so much. So everyone in the comments, I see that everyone is doing a great job of putting great lines. Start thinking of questions too, uh, as I bring up Cindy Beach. Uh, everyone say bye to Harry for a second. Bye, Harry. I would meet myself, right? Okay. Yes. All right, Cindy, it's your turn. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And um, I just want to thank Harry for inviting me to read tonight with her. So great to meet you and Cabin Carry Press for hosting this and supporting all their authors. And thank you to the audience for spending your time with us tonight. Really appreciate it. I'm going to read from my uh, book, Gloved Against Blood, which um, explores inherited histories against the backdrop of the 19th century patriarchal textile mills of Lowell, Massachusetts, where my great grandmother, a French Canadian immigrant, worked as a mill girl. So the poems um, use this lens to explore not just industry, but also women's work and family history. 
the first poem um, is actually turned out to be the poem that triggered this entire manuscript. So when I wrote it, I had no idea what it would uh, lead to. How a community of women. How my French Canadian great grandmother and great great aunts toiled 13 hours a day in the textile mills of Lowell, Massachusetts. How weak the light when they left the boarding house each morning. How screaming starlings flash mobbed them along the way. How they sucked thread through the eye of their foot long wooden shuttles that fed the cotton to the looms. How they called that quick motion of their lips the kiss of death. How they could not converse over the cacophonic clickety click clickety clack of 500 howling looms. How they walked back in ear ringing darkness, had dinner, then took up their needlework. Crochet, cruel, cross stitch, knitting, mending, knitting, darning. Close work, women's work. My mother taught me, her mother taught her, her mother taught her. My great grandmother was referred to as Meme, so that's mentioned in this poem. Coming to Massachusetts. Imagine the sky pink the morning Meme left Quebec for a mill job in Massachusetts. Imagine so many reasons to go, worn land, lean crops, debt, and not to go, her family, her country, her root tongue. Imagine Meme before the only image that exists, a daguerreotype, younger, maybe two small trunks, a stoic look back, one hand still waving. Um, I wrote a few um, persona poems for the book that were based on research I did um, using the Lowell Offering, which is a literary journal for the mill girls where they could write stories and poems about their experience. How it resists. And sometimes it's too much, these aisles of crowded looms, their stanchions of white thread spooling like udders, my needy shuttles of flowering dogwood for its hardness, for how it resists splintering for the way it loves to be polished smooth. Some days the floor slants, the room seems cockeyed, light muddles too slim for eyes to see the eye, and the whole mill howls as if cotton were milk, the way mirrors held just right create an infinity of eye. So this, um, this next poem is, uh, it's in three short parts. Uh, triptych, Le Travail d'Aguil, which translates to um, needlework. And there's an epigraph from Jory Graham. A spot where a story now gone has ridden, the yarn spinning free. <clears throat> One, Nanny. She could handle the finest yarn. When it tried to fly away, she made it stay wrapped it tight around two fingers, pulled it over, under, knit, purl, knit, purl. Her needles clicked. If she dropped a stitch, she picked it up quick. If she found a mistake, she'd rip the piece all the way back and start over. Evenings were for needlework, passing the time, she'd say. Busy work, my father said. She left school in eighth grade, the oldest girl. She had to care for baby Rose. Two, Penelope. Nowhere in the literature is the shroud described, size, variegation, gauge, thread, only the deed itself. Penelope, weaving by day, unweaving by night. Modern psychology has named this perpetual activity without progress, a condition agnostic of gender. But she was not a sufferer, this weaver of strategies and this to avoid capture. To thwart, she claimed the distaff and the shuttle. Three, Meme. I've seen the steps she climbed each morning to begin another day in the mill. They spiral like a beaded periwinkle toward a far off rectangle of light. 
Three years she threw the shuttle through the web of cotton threads before she stopped for him. And then the 13 births, the lost one's name was Rose. He shuttled between women. The close work kept her calm. She bore the thimble well and climbed the steps each morning. So my grandmother and my mother grew up uh, speaking French in the home. Um, this poem is called Accent. And it has a quote from um, the Uniform Hours of Labor from 1881. With some exception, the Canadian French are the Chinese of the Eastern States. Accent. It's true my people were scabs who crossed picket lines in the dark, weren't afraid to turn fingers into bone or ruin their hearing from the din of screeching looms. French filled the home where my grandmother was born and raised, right, white clapboard with a glassed in porch, on a curving street. She drove me past when she still drove. Rough times in Lowell after the mills shut down. I made fun of her Yankee accent, ka and yod. She worked hard to talk like that. Um, so there are a few poems in the collection that um, talk about sewing and various needlework. That was something that the mill girls would do at the end of their shifts when they'd gather in the common room. And it's something that was um, passed down in my family. So I'll read one of those uh, needlework type poems, notions. Mother of pearl and bone buttons, coats and Clark thread. I'd sort and touch every notion in her basket with its silk loops for thimbles and pine posts for bobbins. First day of school outfits, hems, elbow, and knee patches, she conjured from that basket. I need some notions meant a trip to Woolworths, ice cream at the soda fountain for me, every flavor of rickrack, bias tape, grow grain for her. How she could darn socks by the hour, create buttonholes by hand always kept her notions organized, neat, so she could find what she needed, a rhinestone button, safety pins, scarlet embroidery floss to stitch, I love you. She said a woman could never have enough. Fabric could unravel, split, fray, but a woman with notions could mend what was torn, make it like new, button up against his absence. So I'll read, I'll read two more poems. Um, and this next one is called Absent. He left, not as leaves leave, anticipated, lauded, each scarlet, boutonnered usher, cartwheeling, top spinning down into bright spoils heaped at our feet. Not as something erased, where then the branches emptied, brim over with blue, but as a tree splits, cleave to the quick, roots uprooted, ants, aphids, nematodes, disowned in the dark, in the eye of it. And then the last one is um, called Earthlings, and there is an epigraph from Laura Kosiski, uh, things that are beautiful and die. On a plane, we say souls, 100 souls aboard. Not the same with cars, as if proximity to earth negates the idea that we are more beautiful than matter. Is that why down here the trooper covers the body with a sheet and two deer side by side on the shoulder of the highway, legs splayed like clothespins that lost their grip, our emptied carcasses filling with pyramids of new snow featherweight? The plow blade sparks blue when it finds pavement, flickers. These balding out of balance tires carry us, each rotation stitched to the next. If luck holds, random and catch as catch can, but viable, viable here on earth and nowhere else and nowhere next.
<laughs> Thank you so, so much. I did that embarrassing novice thing where I was still muted and I was talking. Uh, I've gotten to read both of your books and it is such a different experience to read it, uh, to read it alone and then hear both of you speak it in person. And I'm so excited because boy, oh boy, we have a bunch of different questions already. So I'm going to try to not talk that much and get into the questions. First question is from Angel Hogan, and it's for Cindy Beach. You mentioned your mother and grandmother spoke French. Have you or do you write poems in French? I did write some poems in French in college, and I have not since, and my French is terrible. <laughs> oh, man, yeah, it's, it's something that you're out of practice I can, with. I can read it better than I can speak it. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, especially with uh, languages as phonetic as French, if, if you start because the thing is, I'm like that as a, as a Spanish speaker also. If you don't practice it, you kind of lose the inflection. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so this question is for Harry. Uh, and this is from Gabe. So Gabe said, I'm interested in hearing about the process of so intimately connecting the history of Eva Hesse with your own experience. Does that help to put the pain into sharper relief or to define it more clearly? Is her story now embedded in your own memory or that part of your life? I love persona poems. I love the poet AI. I was grounded in Berryman too. So I did want to write about a time in my life that was very painful. And I, I don't think I intentionally wanted to subsume the personality of Eva Hess. I just started writing poems. And the more I, you know, found that, I, and then I started looking at her art and it just happened organically. You know, mm. it just kind of came together. Um, she actually has a lot in common with me. So um, a lot she doesn't have in common with me, but some of the things that she did have in common with me were pretty big things. So I related on those levels and yeah, I, I, I think the persona gives us a lot of freedom. Um, you know, the beauty is truth, truth is beauty, and that's all you need to know on earth, Keats wrote, and mm -hmm. everyone applies it to poetry, but poetry is a literature of the imagination, so. Um, it's great not to have the expectations that a modern, a contemporary audience has thinking that the speaker is me. Mm, interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also even field uh, this question to Cindy because there's a bit of a historical poetics uh, work that's going on with your material. So how do you handle persona uh, in your work? So, I mean, in my case, reading a lot of the writings of the Mill Girls and their particular stories, Right, help right. me write those persona poems. And, uh, and speaking of writing, this is also from Angel Hogan. Uh, so, and this is for both of you, but Cindy, since uh, have you pinned, you can go first. So <laughs> curious about your writing practices during uh, isolation. Have you been writing more or less, no change? <laughs> um, okay. Um, I've probably been writing a little bit more. I have done, I do a monthly, um, we call it the cleanse. It's a it's a week long uh, writing every day process, and we share in a group. Um, but I've done more of those with other people during this time. So I would say I'm probably writing more, spending more time on revision, and um, and I'm kind of like the opposite. I am a completely disorganized person. If you can see my desk, uh -huh. it's just a wrap. So um, I'm just loving this time of no expectations. You know, I did write a rather long poem about COVID that I'll read when we get when we get back. It's not real long, don't worry about it. But no, I'm not I'm 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 not I'm not working a lot. Okay. And and everyone has their process, right? Um I, I was I was sitting with uh, uh for an interview with Kava Akbar before and uh he actually mentioned the this old uh Iranian anecdote of are you the cat writer or are you the bull writer, right? Are you the bull writer that wakes up at 4 a.m. and plows the field for 12 to 15 hours? And, and that's the writer that keeps on their same schedule. Or are you this cat writer that wakes up for a couple of hours, hangs out, eats, goes back to bed? And that's kind of like the sporadic writer. So I think with writing, it's also important for us to know what kind of writers we are and, and when, when, um, when the pen is calling us to the page, right? Um, so Kevin asked, uh, Cindy, uh, you mentioned that the first poem of the collection actually got you going. Can you talk about that and where you went from there? Um, 
Well, the first poem sort of coincided with my mother started to have some memory issues. And it was like she flooded me with all these stories of her childhood and growing up. It's, it's like she just wanted to, I don't know if she knew what was happening, but she wanted to get everything out. And so I was sort of inundated with all this information. And I wrote that particular poem, the first one that I read. and. Um, it, it captured so many themes that I felt like I had to explore in more detail, which triggered other poems. So it was sort of like the floodgates opened and in combination, I started doing research, you know, visited with the mills and, um, and I've never been like a person really that interested in history, you know, to where I studied it. But so it was, interesting to me that I, this is all based on history, really local history. So it was a different muse for me than I'd experienced before. Interesting. So, so I know, I know both of you are, you, you both write, uh, wrote historical poetic work, but I, I know you also explore other avenues and we can argue that all poetry is a history in some sense, whether it's present or past. Um, so how, how do you, how do you negotiate or, or feel like um, writing on historical moments actually perpetuated writing rather than writing about the now or things that have been most recent? Um, what, I, what, I, what I'm interested in is, is in when that comes together. Mm -hmm. And if you think of a stanza like a, like a symphony, you know, there's the drums, there's the, you know, the percussion, the strings, the whatever, the harp, I don't know. But, you know, all these different parts of the orchestra, and I feel like that time is, that's how we encapsulate time. So I mm. just love writing, actually for that very reason. I love to make that happen. I love for time to just twist and strand mm. together so it's inseparable. And isn't it so awesome, like for all you writers out there to just be in control of that time, right? And like, we, we feel we can extend a moment or we, 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 can, we can jump such, such a, a wide lens or a far lens. Uh, Cindy, what about you? I think that the um, using history as a backdrop becomes a passageway to more difficult things, maybe more difficult personal things to write about. That's what it's been for me. It's really been a vehicle to reach other places. So. Mm -hmm. um, it's about more than the history, right? It's like that becomes a lens. Right, right. Excellent. Excellent. So I think I'll have time for maybe one or two questions and then the rest of the questions we could say towards the end. Um, and Andrea, and I hope it's not Andreas, or if it's Andreas, I'm sorry. Uh, Harry, your second or third poems really struck me. The frame, was it connected to framing any particular mm -hmm. situations for you? I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good call. <laughs> Andrea said that. I like that. Love you, Andrea. <laughs> oh, excellent. Excellent. All right. Uh, from Gabe, Cindy, you write a lot of poems from the perspective of historical figures, especially those exploited or forgotten. I wonder if you could talk about how important it is to recover and recover lost voices. Sure. Um, well, I think for me, um, it's, imp it's important to recover the lost voices, not just of maybe someone who was um, in history, you know, these mill girls, but in my own personal life, you know, my great grandmother, my people that are lost. So everything, if you think about someone's entire life can come down to a sentence, right? You know, she worked at a mill or she worked at a shoe factory or it, what we remember of someone is so little that to me it's important to try to manifest more of that through poetry and um and somehow there's some kind of immortality in that i guess for me oh, oh yeah excellent thank you um i do i do want to give some time we have a couple of other questions but i do want to give time for some other reading uh harry you can go into uh your corona piece if you'd like new poems yeah and um okay. instead of the seven if we could just leave five minutes on the clock because we have sure. the rooms for questions thank you 
I'm going to read two poems, and I think they go into one another. Um, the first one is about uh, dedicated to Cindy right now. Uh, Cindy, it's about my great uncle. He was born in 1881, and he died in 1941. And then the second poem, you know, is going to foreground that material. The second poem is about COVID. Okay, it's called You're Welcome. Grass swords browned at the hills, drowned in fog. I come across their sharp points as if a homing device had pointed me here for the first time and walk across that grass where it can offend me, cut by cut. I wanted to see it for myself. Huts, forests, the sound of rifle fire round after round, what we heard in an alleyway ricochet off the walls when your daughter went back to fetch her boots. And again, turning to the earth. It's fields of sunflowers, building light, mimicking the path of the real sun, the real swords, the real grass, because this cannot be forever. The lifting of this fog to show me clearly, hover over my failures, I who was told nothing, and could not imagine my parents' silence as the accompaniment to trauma. Walking toward the abandoned distillery where you were forced to work, I hear the ping of stone. There are ghosts here released in the absence of bodily form, pulsing bits of shattered light, sticking into the ground, low-lying, unsanctified. I consider picking them up, saving them in my pockets, like the wine glass the groom smashes in the wedding ritual. They exist where no, mo where no monument stands. This one is called After, tw After 26 Days Under Quarantine, and it's it's based on a refrain after 26 days by uh, Lu Shabao, the Chinese um, dissident who was killed. He died of liver cancer and in, in jail. And um, he actually won a Nobel, he's a Nobel laureate after 26 days. How could I not miss the Schuylkill's cadastre above the river? It's kaleidoscopic reflections of skyscrapers, skyscrapers splitting the city into human views and bird views, roofs bobbing on ripples, held steady in the rivers quivering like the equilibrium some people teach themselves, riding, moving upward from the bank to deliver me to naps in the sun. I thought my days would drift continuous as that bridge, spanning 24th Street to 32nd. Thought our survivor mechanisms anchored us the way the metal threads tying girder to girder or soldered to even the most drunken beam, the one stretched like wings with the most beautiful curving arch. I thought I could see the Lenny Lenape who once paddled across at daybreak, they too believing in the movement of their arms. Count the ringneck pheasants from a century ago, darting in and out of the pilings, hot and fiery, enacting the motions of escape. See my grandparents embarking from the Sobieski, the simmering engines roaring up, my grandmother, a toddler, nestled in my Aunt Rose's arms. Come across the tussled packets of letters hidden in a locked box, the sway of their handwriting, their sweet skins, the words on them nearly lost. For three days it rains. I open the letters one by one, spread them ac across a, a glass table and pin a double A battery to each corner to keep them from collapsing onto themselves. Each letter's resin rendering an essence. I can hardly bear to look at rain hitting the windows, falling slantwise in wind. At times I hear thunder and see lightning's garrulous expedition across the sky. Yes, the world appears monstrous, out of control, crossing borders into a perdition. I put together the few words of Yiddish I am able to translate myself and surmise that the great aunts and uncles left in 1940s Azuriani were waiting to beg for money to burst out from under their tightening restrictions. At first, edicts against wearing coats, then anything made of wool. I see them, young couples cutting into a plaster wall with a knife, trying to build a hiding place between the joists. They take breaks for letter writing, desperate scrolls boomeranging through streets where no one walks anymore. They memorize the book titles they, keep, they kept in their libraries and debate whether the titles or riddles or stitches stretch across satin pillows. They imagine the sons they would have. One says his would collect boas, marvel at deep 
green pouches and scales, patterning star-like limbs, defenses for warding, warding off enemies. He would spend hours cleaning the aquariums, handling his favorites, stroking their skins as they slither across his shoulders, identifying with their unacknowledged beauty. Others talk about their daughter's hair, the messages for the outside world they will wind into the weave of her braids. I return to the letters. It is the last batch. I open the flap on the final envelope. I look around the room. I live in a country where two sides are plotting against each other, where snakes are more innocent than people, where a boy feeds them dry insects as a placeholder for what to do next. 26 days have passed since I spoke with a woman who offered to translate the letters, divulge what life their sentences hold, explain how syntax is constructed on a clean piece of paper, but made tensile to withstand force. Checking my calendar, I search for what would have been our meeting, but where is sunlight picking out the address above her door when I walk inside and sip her just harvested mint tea, ingest the warm steep deep inside my lungs. The woman I imagine wears a long braid pinned up under a flowered kerchief, a Muslim shift, simple clothing in response to difficulties, but there is no one opening the door to let me in. I rehate the kettle, pour another cup. My spoon clinks against my chipped porcelain mug. It will not sweeten my tea. There is no sugar. The grocery shelves are empty. The grocery stores have been boarded up. Signs are posted thanking customers to their loyal service. In the absence of people, more pheasants shy of open space will find their way to the river, sleek in a wave of boats. Downtown will be stubbled with groundhogs, woodchucks, foxes, coyotes, jackals openly creeping along the sidewalks, crawling through chain link fences, knocking over barbecue grills, clawing through the coals, leaping from fire escapes and dumper, dumpsters, leaving scratch trails on shop windows, 26 days of sheltering inside, not knowing what logic the letters hold, written by people who never walk through the streets of their city again. For every genius of life, except the human, the city is a homecoming. Oh my goodness, so many great things. Uh, shout out to Rebecca for getting Harry's book so she could read that line again. Harry, thank you so much. Uh, just for the sake of time, I wanna move right into Cindy. Um, then we'll go back to the Q&A. Great, great work, everyone, thank you. I'm just gonna read a few poems from my next collection, which is Cabin Carey will be publishing in October of 2021. Um, this, book is themed around the Salem witch trials um, and uh, again uses that as a backdrop um, to move into personal history and politics so covers a gamut. Um, I witch. So what if I woke up changed? It's not like I'm a wild hog or some evil thing, not a real hog that follows you home jumps into the window, a monkey with cock's feet with claws. Don't believe what my accuser says or believe it. The fact is my divorce attorney's building sits on the side of the prison where they kept the accused in chains in 1692. I came there with a silk scarf worn loosely at the neck, borders looped with colored thread. He came with daisies, dark chocolate and proclaimed, my wife came towards me and found fault with me. Downstairs in the dungeon, they chained us to the walls to keep our spirits from escaping in the likeness of a bird. I wrote a few of the poems in the book are um, tributes to the female victims of the witch trials. Rebecca, nurse of the accused. At first, the jury returned not guilty, to which the judge said, retire and reconsider the not. After all, she had not answered the question she had not heard, guilty of being hard of hearing, maybe mouthing, what? Guilty of having a temper, arguing with neighbors. Guilty, too, of piety, 39 attesting to her deep devotion. Still, the afflicted swore it was her apparition that did the pinchings and prickings of their flesh. And in court, when she raised her arms, the afflicted raised their arms, and when she inclined her head, the afflicted inclined their heads. And I'll just read one more in the interest of time. Uh, this one is about Martha Carrier, who was hanged uh, uh, August 19, 1692. 
Trump has called the Mueller investigation a witch hunt 84 times. They said she brought smallpox to Andover. They said she killed her father and brother, making her queen of hell, AKA landowner. Neighbors testified it was none other than Goody Carrier or haunted them at night. They said she bit Sue Sheldon, threatening to cut her throat because she wanted her to sign the book. She stuck a pin in Dum and Putnam, killed Samuel Preston's cow for being very lusty. And there was that devil man whispering in her ear. Somehow she caused the death of Alan Toothacre's cat. For these complaints, though each one was a lie, she was condemned by the grace of God to die. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. I got that rhyme at that last part. Excellent, yeah. excellent. <laughs> oh man, I, I can't wait to read that collection too. Um, great. Okay, so Elizabeth Harowitz said, I love both of these po I love both of these two poets. I see some similarities. <laughs> Could you both talk about your poetry origins and influences? I love both of these. Oh, it was copied twice, but that's okay. I'm a good reader. I saw that it was twice. Okay, <laughs> so poetry origins and influences. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but every book that Kevin Curry publishes. <laughs> ah, good. I, that was a test you passed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I echo that, of course, but my origins, I mean, I'd say Emily Dickinson probably mm. has been my, you know, biggest influence. Um, and then later, you know, James Wright, who I love, um, as well as Adrian Rich and mm. Platt. I mean, mm. yeah. Thank you. Lots yeah. of favorites. <laughs> Harry, uh, just one poet that you're reading now or one book that you're reading now that's influencing well, you. Well, I'm, I'm teaching this course on, it's, it's in, called Endangered Writers. I've been teaching mm. it for about five years. And um, Lou, Lou Chabelle, um, Anna Polakowskaya, she's not a poet, she was a, she was a journalist, but mm. she was killed by the Kremlin. And, um, you know, I, I, I teach pen writers um, this is Ahram Alisi. Catherine Young, the poet, translated as a beautiful book. Um, I, I, I teach endangered writers from around the world, and um, I'm just so awed Excellent. by their bravery. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, and that's an unfortunate thing too. And it's a conversation as an indie press that we have and, and just wider with other artists is that there's so much great writing out there, and it's just really hard to try to find this great writing in the sea of other great writing. So that's why we're so great and blessed that Kevin Carey Press to do things like this and give uh, authors like you all more voice because it, it's so necessary. Mm, thank you so much. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, Harry, uh, someone else said, uh, first, love this volume of poems. There are some poems in your book from 1965. How did they <laughs> find their way into this collection? So the title has a uh, date after it, 1965, 1966, maybe. Those were the titles of Eva Hess's paintings. So she has like hang up and she did it in 1966. But I love that it's working that way for you, Abby. I, I, you're an artist, so you would know. And I just <laughs> love that because, hey, that's great. <laughs> Excellent. But it's really the title of the, of the painting and when it was painted. Yeah. <laughs> I would also both encourage you to just look in the chat box because there's so much love everyone's throwing uh, you from this conversation and it's just been really great. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. I'm just scrolling. There's nine new messages. All right, give me one second. I promised myself I wouldn't fall behind. Um, so while I'm looking, I think what I, what I could say is this. Uh, what is it like for the both of you to uh, read online when you can't actually be in front of your audience? That, and especially when you're, you're home and it's quiet and you read a poem and then there's just that that happens after you read the poem. How, how does that translate for you reading from home rather than you reading for yeah. an audience? Well, it's definitely, it's very different. It's, um, you know, you kind of you can't really have eye contact the way you're used to or but you know i'm getting used to it but it's yeah it's not the same but it, i'm so glad to have this opportunity and i guess the the great thing about it is you can be with people that are across the country like ingrid went who 
um, her late husband, Ralph, was my teacher at Oregon. Wow. And oh. now she's here and she's in Oregon, but she could, where she couldn't be in an in-person reading, this is the one beauty of these, these virtual readings. Wow, that's amazing. Ingrid, thank you for being here. Thank you for everyone that decided to come. I know you all have very busy schedules. There's a bunch of other places you have to be. So thank you for being here. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, thanks everybody. Of course. Yeah. And I actually, I actually think we're finishing in good time. Everyone's saying thank you. Everyone uh, is ready. Uh, so yeah, audience and Harry and Cindy, thank you so much for this reading. It was an absolutely great experience. I am quenched. Um, mm -hmm. So th this has been excellent. Do you have any final words, the two of you? Uh, just be safe, everybody. And thank you so much for coming. Yeah, buy, definitely. buy the books. <laughs> Support Kevin Curry. Right, um, right. <laughs> thank you. Now everyone could freeze. Thank you. As the marketing person, I do want to take a picture of all of us before we go. I, I do have the grid up here. So if anyone that is not on screen, if you can just get on screen for a second. Um, if you need to put your Brad Pitt picture up in the screen, I just need something in that box over there. So get that ready and then we'll all just take a picture. Okay, I think basically waiting on a couple of people. I think we're ready to do this. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing some very beautiful people. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to do our first screenshot. I have to do two pages because there's so many of us. So smile. All right, one more. All right. Smile. All right. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, so everyone, thank you so much. If you want to stick around and ask a couple of more questions, I'll be here for a couple more minutes about the press or the authors. But for everyone else, have a good night. Uh, stay blessed and stay healthy. Stay safe. Peace.